Welcome everyone to another performance clinic today. It's called Mastering Chaos Engineering Experiments with Gremlin and Dynatrace. My name is Andy Grabner and with me, hola, Anna. Hola, como estan? I'm super excited to be here and get to present what chaos engineering is and how to do this with Dynatrace and with Gremlin. Perfect. So thank you so much for being on this, uh, on this YouTube tutorial with me. For folks that are just uh, watching this and just jumping uh, in either live or watching this offline. There's a lot of more of these on the YouTube channel. You can see the link here, the Bitly One Agent Tutorials. If you have never tried Dynatrace, you can just sign up for a SAS trial. We'll hear a lot about Gremlin today as well. I'm pretty sure, Anna, you will give the details on how people can find Gremlin. And I'm also doing a podcast called Pure Performance, uh, which it's always interesting also to get more listeners and also more topics. That's why, Anna, um, definitely I want to have you <laughs> on the podcast as well. I love this invitation in middle of our, our tutorial today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, um, I, I wanna kick it off and I think Anna, you, I can already control your screen. That's awesome, thanks for, uh, for trusting me uh, with actually having control because you're sharing. Now, Anna, I, when we kind of started discussing this, I said, you know, when, we, when I look at the customers in our community that we interact with, then over the years, we have, as Dynatrace, not only tried to give a good monitoring tool uh, to our customers, a monitoring platform, but we really want to help people become better as it comes to pushing out more innovation faster and also getting better in remediating issues in case something slips through your quality gates. Uh, we've done surveys over the years where, um, and there's a link on the bottom in case somebody wants to fill it out, dynatrace.ai slash AC survey. And this is actually results from, from last year. And unfortunately, only a very small percentage of the, of the enterprises that we, we surveyed within our customer base, that they, they are deploying fast, MTTI, mean time to innovation, meaning the time from there's a new artifact available until it's in production and those that are also fast in remediating. So the question really for me is how can we, uh, how can we help people get better in both sides? Is it even possible? And for me, it feels like there's two, there's a lot of things that, that can have a positive impact here, but there's two things in the recent months or year that kind of stood out for me as, pre as best practices. Progressive delivery is one of those to get things out faster with, with less risk and also chaos engineering to get better in remediation. And now coming to like why you are here, and this is something that I just put all, pulled, pulled off the web. I know you're going to speak live this week, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, it's actually in 24 hours. I'll be speaking at Trajectory Live and I'll also be doing a live Q&A. Um, I'll be talking just as like uh, Andy mentioned, like those two things that are like are really driving folks to innovate faster to actually mitigate their incidents in a, in a faster manner mm -hmm. uh, with progressive delivery and chaos engineering. That's one of like those, those two practices in the DevOps site reliability engineering world that we're seeing that allow for us to actually spend time experimenting, but continue being customer focused while keeping outages at a really, really small scale. So um, if, if you're interested in like learning about how chaos engineering and progressive delivery play in hand with each other, whether you want to do them simultaneously or do one or the other, you should definitely check out that talk. Mm -hmm. And we should, again, it's another topic that I may want to invite you back. Uh, today, we want to focus on chaos engineering, right? So that's also why we highlighted chaos. You are, you are a chaos engineer at Gremlin and uh, your talk is obviously kind of bridging the gap between uh, the two disciplines. Um, before I want to start with a couple of questions that I want to get answered in this webinar, any additional words about you, your background, what you do? Um, very much like I, I like breaking stuff. I, I got a chance to start writing code in 2007. I was pretty young, but that's kind of like where my tinkering with technology started. And I got a chance to work in like front end development, back end development. That's kind of like where I was like self taught. And I later transitioned to become an iOS Android developer. That was a little bit short lived because I got a chance to get started in site reliability engineering like a year or two after. Mm -hmm. And when I got started in uh, chaos engineering, it was very much uh, interesting to me because I hadn't gone through the traditional schooling. I decided to drop out of school and become self-taught. And 
cyber liability engineering allowed for me to take a deep dive into what those data centers look like, what cloud infrastructure was, how we actually kept our services up. And this all kind of started at a really interesting time and place. I got started in cyber liability engineering at Uber. And if anyone is familiar with microservices, DevOps, you may have heard that Uber had one of, has one of the largest like microservice environments out there for a lot of these startups. They innovated fast and they ended up having around like 2000 microservices when I joined. So it allowed for me to start actually understanding how to break apart monoliths into microservices, but then what does all this distributed systems do and how does this architecture diagrams come into play when we talk about keeping a company up and running 99.99% of the time. And that's, that's kind of like what brought me to pursue more chaos engineering. And when I joined Gremlin about two and a half years ago, which I'll talk a little bit more about Gremlin, but we're a SaaS platform that allows folks to get started with chaos engineering. And then some other cool stuff about me, I always love mentioning in my talks that I'm a proud Latina, something that's really important to me is representation. And I know when I was looking into this tech space, there wasn't many Latinas that were out there, nonetheless, Latinas and DevOps are giving talks. So I'm a proud born and raised in Costa Rica and my parents are Nicaraguans. So just a, a shout out to carry my, my flags with a lot of pride. I need to link you to my wife because she's a Colombian. Uh, as I think I've told you, she works at Dynatrace too uh, in our ACE autonomous cloud enablement team. And I've been trying to get her to speak and talk about it, but she's still hesitant. But maybe I can I connect will, it to her. I'll give my next talk with her. How about okay, that? that? Sounds good. <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Now, to set the stage, um, I have a couple of questions that came to mind because chaos engineering is also new for me, even though I, I did some research over the last couple of months because it's a hot topic. But really, what I would like to get out of you today day, Anna. So I really like to get some answers. So like, what is chaos engineering? Which problem does it solve? Right? And I guess, you know, I don't need to read all everything off the list here, but there are some very important ones. Like, uh, it feels for me that chaos engineering is mainly talked about when it comes to cloud native. So does this mean I can only do it in Kubernetes on the microservices or can we also do it on traditional stacks? I think we have a lot of our community members that are dealing with a lot of, let's say, classical enterprise applications. So is chaos engineering also something that they can do? Uh, obviously, what's the role of monitoring observability? In my case, like, you know, with my Dynatrace background and with some folks on the line today, they will have Dynatrace uh, as their monitoring solution. So we want to hear a little bit more about that. How does one get started and also what's next? So these are kind of my questions that I would like to get answered. If people that are on the line live, if you have questions, just use the question feature as a reminder. And maybe Anna, before I kick it over to you, I do have a, a, a polling question. So let's actually start. I, have, I just launched a polling question so that we can actually uh, get a little feel of the audience um, of, you know, have you heard about chaos engineering before? Uh, never heard about it before, heard about it not doing it. Um, we have having plans. So I think it seems people are starting to answer. That's awesome. Results are coming in. Um, I'm surprised that nobody yet has said chaos engineering is part of our DNA. I was about to say, I'm surprised that hosts actually can't vote on a poll. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have one person now. That's very cool. So I think this gives us a little overview of who the audience actually is, right? It seems there's only a small number that has never heard of chaos engineering before. So 20%-ish. 20, 20 um, and uh, a large group is the ones that are planning to do it. I think that's great. Um, now, let me, let me close the polling. Uh, thanks again for the attendees. And now, Anna, I'm really uh, interested in you know, getting your take on it. Walk us through chaos engineering and then what we need to know about it. Definitely. Um, if, if you have any questions, as Andy mentioned, feel free to drop them in the Q&A and then and Andy will start positioning them as he sees them best fit. Mm -hmm. So first, um, I'm removing your remote control, Andy, sorry. Sure. It was <laughs> <It's okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so first, I wanted to talk about why do we do this? Like, And with this, we have to take a, take a step back and actually look at what our systems are looking. And when I say now, I like the, the screenshots that I have up here are actually a little outdated. These are the, the 
dead stars of Amazon.com and Netflix five years ago. It's, it's still bizarre to me to think about what, the, what these distributed systems that these organizations look like five years later. But with this slide, what we end up seeing is that whether you're on a monolith, whether you're in a microservices, this is exactly what our applications are looking like today in 2020. Complexity only keeps on cre increasing and there's goods and bads that come out of it. A lot of this movement got started as companies started moving from bare metal data centers, their own data centers to the cloud. Once we start doing this, we start having that complexity where we don't have access to our data center just as we used to have. And then we now have also seen the movement to containerization such as Kubernetes. And when we start doing that, our complexity only keeps increasing. So when we actually talk about why do we do chaos engineering, this is one of those things that we always wanna think about how our systems are, how distributed they are, how many failures can actually happen. And the reason that we do this is to be proactive and get ahead of all these possible failures that can happen. And I didn't add a slide on it, but to have a little bit more about like the history of chaos engineering, we actually end up looking back at Netflix. Netflix is known as the organization that coined chaos engineering. And that is because various years ago, they open sourced a project called Chaos Monkey. Chaos Monkey was, well, it's, it's actually still a tool. It's part of this Netflix Simian army. They have created this open source project for chaos engineering that allows for them to just shut down an EC2 instance wherever, whenever they want it. The big reason for this is that Netflix was one of those first companies that decided to put all their, their bets on AWS. And they wanted to know that as they continued building Netflix, that folks were still able to stream across the globe. And in order to do that, they were like, well, if a host in my cloud dies, my application should, should handle it properly. So that's where chaos engineering kind of starts getting coined. But of course, we have learned that many organizations have actually been doing this for various years. When we actually look at where amazon.com we see that uh, Jesse Robbins used to just unplug data center servers and basically be like, this is our chaos engineering. So it's actually interesting to see how it's evolved. And of course, I'll be talking about Gremlin that comes as a SaaS platform that takes a lot of those learnings. And when we talk about other reasons for doing this, a lot of it comes from the cost of downtime or organization knowing that this is really, really expensive. But we also have to talk about the fact that just in general, like our systems are so complex, whether we're in a distributed system on the cloud, on microservices, failures are going to happen. And we won't know if they're causing downtime unless we're proactively testing for them. And that is exactly what chaos engineering is about. You are proactively testing those possible failures that can happen. And for, for more reasons on why to do this, you might feel like this little dog in the middle of an incident or just maybe your daily engineer life, ops life, where you're just like, this is fine. I'm constantly on call. I'm constantly getting paged. And you kind of feel like that's, that's kind of like what you have to do right now. But there's better ways to not constantly be firefighting and chaos engineering is one of the ways to get there. And the other thing is that when we look at 2020, when we look at where we're at right now, we actually realize that we need to be building more resilient systems and it's a lot harder. So it might be that maybe it's the first time that you're on call during this pandemic and you actually have never gotten trained to how to communicate with your teammates or how to onboard to all these production tools. But then we also take it a step further that because we're all online, anywhere in the globe right now, we're seeing that our applications on our systems are actually having a larger load. And if anything, they're more critical, where, whether you're a bank, a financial uh, service application, or anything like that, you're having more users be on there. So you're actually seeing more traffic spikes, you might be seeing more issues going on. And nonetheless, maybe the third party vendors that you also have are having some of those huge traffics. And we have to be testing for those failures. Mm -hmm. So to actually give you a definition of chaos engineering, the big definition is that chaos engineering is the science of performing intentional experimentation on a system by injecting precise and measured amounts of harm. This is done to observe how the system responds for the purpose of improving the system's resilience. So today we're going to be just 
following this science and performing experiments, measuring those, the, like observing those experiments using Dynatrace, and we'll also be keeping that user experience in mind as we go along. And for the definition that is a little bit more precise and just really way smaller, is that chaos engineering is thoughtful, planned experiments designed to reveal the weakness in our systems. And as you see, I have bolded the words thoughtful and planned. Chaos engineering is not about breaking production. That's not what you want to do this for. This is not about just launching an experiment in order to make sure that your friend or your engineering team is able to acknowledge pages or anything like that. You want to do this in a planned way. You want to do it thoughtful. You always want to be communicating. And the reason that we do this at the end is to find those weaknesses so we can make our systems more robust and resilient. So when we actually talk about doing chaos engineering, I've mentioned the word experiments, but the reason that we mention experiments is because chaos engineering actually follows a scientific method. So if anyone remembers back in grade school when you learned that scientific method, I get to give you a little bit of a refresher. We first start by observing your system. This is looking at that architecture diagram, looking at your cloud provider, at your data center, how does everything work with each other? Then you also want to, as you're observing your system, this is where baselining your metrics come in play. You want to have some KPIs put in place. Maybe you have already SLOs and SLIs for all your services, and you're able to understand how does my system look like today on a steady state. After you have that, when you're looking at that architecture diagram, you start forming hypotheses, and that could be what happens if this application has a CPU spike, there's a lot of latency, or it's a, it's a third party uh, application, what if this has a failure? How does my application handle it? Mm -hmm. This is when you start forming that hypothesis. If this fails, this is how I expect my application is going to handle it. But as we form that hypothesis, one of the things that we need to think about with chaos engineering is abort conditions. Abort conditions are those things that are going to cause you to halt the experiment. You actually see some examples of that when we get to the demo portion. The other thing you want to define with chaos engineering is that blast radius. Blast radius is how many hoes or containers are you targeting in an experiment that that's kind of where the impact is going. But another way that you can actually look at blast radius is your environment. You want to start off with chaos engineering in Pre-prod, you can do development, staging, testing, Q&A, but at the end of the day, the end goal is to get to production. But you, you want to start off in those safe environments until you build that confidence to graduate to run them in production. Then you want to go ahead and run that experiment. And as you run that experiment, you have to focus on analyzing those results. That is looking at your monitoring, that is looking at your um, user experience as it is. And of course, the more fine tuned your monitoring it is, the more easier chaos engineering is. And after, when you see the chaos engineering experiment be successful, you wanna go ahead and expand that scope and retest it. So that means that if you ran that experiment for just 50% of your fleet on staging, go ahead and run it for maybe 60%, 70% of your fleet and continue doing that until you're able to execute that experiment in production. And lastly, one of those big things with the scientific method is always sharing your results. With chaos engineering, you want to do that. You want to share with your leadership what are some of the things that you've made better in your applications and systems by doing chaos engineering. But you can also take it a step further and you can share with the open source communities that you're part of the ways that you've made these uh, open source technologies more resilient or maybe even give a talk at a conference about the failures you've, you've encountered. So when it actually comes to implementing this scientific method, what are some actual practical use cases on doing chaos engineering? There's various reasons why organizations get started with chaos engineering or that they, as they're doing chaos engineering, they realize that they have some unknown kind of things that they, they learn along the way. And those things are kind of summed up and there's even more than what I cover in this slide, but one of those main things with chaos engineering is that you're actually able to verify monitoring. 
the last thing you want is to be on call and realize that you didn't set up your monitoring properly, that the link on the runbook to the monitoring dashboard was incorrect. So making sure that all those things are precise when you're not going through an incident is really, really critical. And of course, as you fine tune your monitoring more, your engineering team also is able to like focus on that mean time to detection, being able to find those causes for, for incidents. Another reason to do chaos engineering is that you can actually use chaos engineering to train your engineers to be on call. I don't know about y'all, but when I got started and got put on call for the first time, I got thrown a pager duty account, I got thrown a run book, and it was said, good luck, you can figure it out. Why don't we do that in a nicer way and actually train folks of, let's run you through some exercises, let's do some fire drills so you know psychologically where your head needs to be and what you actually need to do to do your job. You can also use chaos engineering to right size your infrastructure. You can use this to migrate to the cloud, break apart your monolith to microservices. Those are two things that we've seen a lot of our customers focus on. With chaos engineering, one of my favorite use cases is actually replicating outages. So this means replicating outages that you've seen happen at your organization, maybe the largest incident you had three, four months ago, finding out what the conditions that contributed to that incident are, and then implementing experiments just to make sure that you're not regressing into failure. And if maybe you're an organization that says, hey, I haven't had a large outage in a while, and I don't know what I should be doing to replicate outages, well, you can actually take it a step further and look at the outage communities. There's like learning from incidents. IO is one of the examples that I give where you can take incidents that have happened out in other companies and look at those postmortems and build conditions out of that. And of course, with chaos engineering, you're also able to test your disaster recovery that you know how to uh, fail over from one data center to the other, from being able to spin up more capacity if you need it, and what one of the other use cases with chaos engineering is being able to verify that product launch, especially as we're innovating so fast, how do we actually make sure that the products that we're putting out there are really polished? And even though they're, they're gonna be using more resources or that they have other dependencies, how do, we meet, how do we make sure that we're going above just testing for those? And if you're interested about that last point, you should definitely check out that progressive delivery talk because it talks about how to actually do that. Hey, Anna, let me just draw, uh, push over one question that just came in from James. Uh, can chaos engineering run as part of SRE or does it need to become a separate team to be successful? No, so it, it easily falls into uh, site reliability engineering. So when I was at Uber, the chaos engineering team was part of site reliability engineering. And of course that makes it a little bit easier because the SREs are actually able to understand more of those critical applications and have those relationships with the devs already. So it's not perfect, like I'm a SRE, I bring you chaos engineering, let's work together to implement it. So that's usually where we see it fit the most with our customers. Of course, we have customers that don't have site reliability engineering teams and they spin up their own chaos engineering organization. Mm -hmm. And just to double check, you mentioned learning from incidents.io, right? That was the one. I believe that's the link. Yeah, I, I just double checked that it. it's good. Yeah, I'll just post it into the uh, chat window because somebody was asking on the chat. Folks, if you can do me a favor, if, more, if you have more questions, uh, chat is great, but uh, use the question answer feature that makes it easier for me to kind of control and know which questions we already uh, asked and, and which ones were answered. Yeah. Yeah, and for the folks asking for the uh, link for learning from incidents, you can also look up on GitHub. There is a postmortem collection that has just a whole bunch of outages. I can drop it out there mm -hmm. on the chat if you want, or you can reach out to me via email and I'm happy to send it over as well. Mm -hmm. And I know there's going to there's more questions coming in, but I want to make sure that we give, we, we give you now enough time to go through the content. Folks, keep asking the questions. We'll make sure that we have dedicated time at the end, but there's a lot of more content that yes. Anna is going to go through. So with, uh, what, as one of the main questions that Andy asked is that this is only for cloud native, is that true? And that is definitely not true. You get to do chaos engineering on your monolith. You get to do this on your microservices, your Kubernetes, and you get to do this on the application level as well. The application level chaos engineering needs its own one hour. So maybe we can actually take a deep dive into that at a later time. But to touch base on how do you do chaos engineering on a monolith, 
is that you can actually be very specific when you implement your experiments. You can actually think about what happens when your application loses connection to a database, when it stops talking to an API, being able to get the ports that those applications are and implementing an experiment of closing that port and being able to see how does the application handle that, whether it was latency, an error, or anything like that that can happen. Being able to handle latency, especially in monoliths, is really, really important. You also want to ask yourself around auto-scaling policies. Maybe you have everything in place that you know where capacity will be hit and how to provision more capacity. And maybe you've also implemented auto-scaling. But until you get to those conditions that kick off the auto-scaling policies, you don't really know. You're not really that confident. So go ahead and build that confidence by being that confidence by doing some experiments on it. And then one of the large ones that we actually saw with uh, MailChimp, MailChimp was they, they actually gave a talk around how they did chaos engineering on a monolith a year ago at ChaosConf, and there's a YouTube recording for it. But one of the ones that Caroline Miller talked about the most was being able to fail over a load balancer without downtime or user impact. Mm -hmm. You don't know how that failover is gonna go unless you just do it. But then, of course, the more practice that your team has, the more confident they feel in doing it. And at the same time, you know all those little things that can happen. Like maybe after you do the load balancer, you're still not seeing the traffic 100% like move. So some of that comes into play with a Dynatrace. How do you actually make sure that you're tracking that users, uh, that the user session, so you actually know that the things that matter for your business are actually being tracked? And when we touch base in doing chaos engineering on the cloud native space, specifically Kubernetes, this has been some of the work that I've been focused on for like over a year now. And we've actually been looking at some of those like large outages that have happened to organizations that have implemented Kubernetes. The number one that keeps on happening is the, the pod auto scaling. The pods are running out of resources and no more nodes are coming up. So making sure that you're validating your HPAs is really important. But you also want to validate how does your application handle when you lose a host. We trust Kubernetes to have a new host for us, depending on the configs that we have. We trust Kubernetes that after a container, a pod dies, we have a new one coming on. But in that, in that time frame from a pod shutting down to a new one coming up, how does that user experience go? Does it, is it terrible for them? Are folks still having something good? Focusing on that rotation is actually a really good way to actually build more resiliency within Kubernetes. As I mentioned, those resource limits are really important. And one of those large ones to think about with Kubernetes is how does your cluster actually handle a DNS outage or a lot of any other cloud provider type of outages? Mm -hmm. And we'll touch base in some of these as we go through our demo too. Yeah. So I think, Anna, there's a couple of questions that just came in and uh, around what's the difference now between chaos engineering and let's say vulnerability testing? What's the difference between chaos engineering and disaster recovery exercises? What's the difference between chaos engineering and just doing some non-functional testing, high load, putting a system under pressure? I, I think you will probably, you know, as, as you will show what chaos engineering tools do, I, I guess we get a better feeling, but it's more like really inflicting chaos at levels that you would normally yeah. not do through uh, load testing tools or uh, vulnerability testing tools. Exactly. You'll see that with the experiments that we'll put together, it's not always stuff that we build into our functional tests or end-to-end -end tests or unit tests. So this goes a step above that. And then, yeah, this is like, you can use chaos engineering to verify your disaster recovery plans. So like continue doing what you need to do for those, but this is just a way to validate them. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what chaos engineering comes in where it's like, you're doing this in order to build practice, to train your team, to just do this in a more automated fashion. So the end goal with chaos engineering is that you have this automated that you're not having to run these exercises mm -hmm. manually with your team. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned that we'll be doing a little bit of a demo with Gremlin. So just to give you a little bit of more information about Gremlin, We've been around for four years. Our founders come from Netflix, Amazon, Salesforce, and we have folks that have been doing chaos engineering for over 10 years at our organization. Uh, we offer a SaaS platform that you actually get to see in the demo that allows for you to implement 11 infrastructure level attacks and then application level fault injection on the chaos engineering side. 
So if you're interested in just spinning up a trial for this, you can head on over to go.gremlin.com slash Anna, and that'll give you a Gremlin free forever account. So it's not the same trial that you kind of get for Dynatrace. We work in a freemium type of uh, model. So you will get Gremlin free forever. And that allows for you to run the shutdown attack, the CPU attack, and the black hole attack. And then if you want to talk to sales to explore more, you can definitely do that. So with that, I get to bring us to our Dynatrace, uh, wow, Dynatrace and Gremlin demo, total words. And to, in order to do our demo, first I actually wanted to go over the demo environment that we're gonna be covering today. So maybe some of y'all have seen this architecture diagram before. This is an online boutique hipster shop that Google Cloud has put together. It's an open source GitHub repo. So if folks are interested in actually spinning up their own environments after, we can post that link. It's 11 tier microservice applications. So this has a front end, this has various services that play onto it, it's ver like very much of an e-commerce where we have our ads, we have our checkout service, our currency service, product catalog service, recommendation service, cart service. So these are some of the things that we usually see in organizations. And when we go back to the scientific method, you want to look at the architecture diagram and start thinking, what happens if X fails? And how does my application actually talk to one another and things like that? But in order to do that, first, we wanted to go through a steady state of our environment. So let me do that. So I'm going to go to my steady state and that link is going to be go.gremlinrocks um, slash Anna Dynatrace demo. And that brings me to my hipster shop that I already had open. So this is how all those services are tying in together. Of course, right now we see the front end. On the front end, we see that we have our product catalogs. So we're able to browse, we're able to click around. We see on here that the recommendation service has other other items that we might like. Due to COVID, I'm now interested in buying a vintage record player. So I go ahead and add that to my cart. I also see that maybe I want some air plants as well. So I went ahead and added this to my cart. And I'm just going to go back to the home page to show you a few more of the services prior to checking out. We see on here on the main uh, front end that we have the ad service that actually populates ads. So you're able to click them and see that the cameras are 20% off. On the item pages, you also see more ads. Over here on the right, you're gonna see your currency service. So if you actually just wanna change around through that, we'll go back to USDs. When we go to view cart, we see that we had our last, our items that we added on here. We see the checkout service has all the information filled out for us. And when we place our order, we were able to just do that without any problems. On here, this is what you want to think about your baseline metrics. What are the response times of your services as no chaos is happening to them? Of course, as you're running this in production, you want to keep in mind that, that traffic portion of it as well. Um, so if you're doing this in pre-prod, maybe you want to spin up some load generating for, for traffic to, to replicate more production-like conditions. So we saw that our steady state is all up and running. We saw no issues. And that was what I wanted to cover first. I'm going to keep my slides like this so I can switch between. So for the first experiment, first I wanted to introduce you an experiment card. This experiment card allows for us to think about that scientific method prior to implementing an experiment. The first experiment we're going to do is actually just validate monitoring. And that is going to be really simple since Dynatrace is already really easy to use, but we want to make sure that we're tracking the proper host, that we have the right Kubernetes cluster spun up. So what we're going to do first is that we're going to implement a CPU attack. This is going to cover all the hosts. We're going to inject 75% of resource consumption on the CPU layer, and we're going to run this experiment for 200 seconds. Our hypothesis is that there is no impact. But as I mentioned, we have to create the hypothesis with the board conditions. What's going to cost for us to halt this experiment? So I'm going to halt this experiment if I get a 400, 500 error, if my browser test that I implemented within Dynatrace fails, or Dynatrace identifies a problem. Those are like the things that we're going to keep in mind 
for us to actually stop that experiment. So we're going to head on over to Gremlin. And we're going to go ahead and go to attacks. We'll create a new attack. And when we get to the new, the new attack page, you'll see that Gremlin allows for you to target the host, the containers, your application, or your Kubernetes cluster specifically. Anna, could you do me a favor? Could you zoom in your browser a little bit? It's, uh, it's a little easier to see if it's zoomed in. Yeah. Perfect, thank you so much. So we see on here that we're gonna first focus on hosts just because we're validating uh, monitoring right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and target all my hosts. I see on here that that blast radius is covering 303 host. When we head on over to choosing a gremlin, since we're just validating monitoring, I'm going to consume CPU resources. We're going to do 200 seconds in order to show you more stuff on Dynatrace as the experiment goes on. And we mentioned we were going to run this for 75% of to, to consume on the CPU. And you can also be specific about the cores, but we're going to go with all cores. Then we're just going to unleash that gremlin. We see on here that Gremlin will give you a little bit of a view of how the experiment is doing. But we see that the experiment is still pending. So we wanna wait for that experiment to start prior to switching over to Dynatrace to look into it. And of course, you always wanna validate the user experience as you do this. So we're gonna actually just go ahead and first start by making sure that our application is not suffering any weird latency, just quickly browsing adding something to my cart, place my order. The user experience is okay. And that's that manual way, of course. With Dynatrace, we can actually do that with our browser tests. So with that, I'm going to do the last 30 minutes view on Dynatrace. I have here my dashboard that allows for me to see that my cluster has three hosts, we have some services. Um, we got to see our CPU usage, some network metrics, the response time. And I do have a synthetics test for our application. But first, I just wanted to make sure that my hosts are showing up on here. And what is actually showing when we do find them, we see that for the last 30 minutes, uh, things have been steady. Um, and right here, when we look into it, we also have an annotation that the Gremlin CPU attack is running. So we're gonna slowly start seeing more of that CPU slowly start spiking up. To give you some view of what our actual like application looks like today, I'm gonna head on over to the Smartscape topology. When we go on here, we get to head on over to the portion of viewing what's running in our AWS application. We see on here. It seems you had a lot of uh, testing done in the last couple of days because Smartscape by, de by default shows you the last 72 hours of hosts and data centers you were, you were doing things on. Yeah, you may want to start on the service level and then go down. Yeah, so it's funny you actually mentioned that because this is what with chaos engineering, you also get to see like how things play very different in cloud providers. So, yeah. but we implemented something on a different Kubernetes cluster on a different cloud provider. And I ended up going back to Amazon because I was like, this one works a little bit better. Yeah. So on here, we see how our services that we showed in the architecture diagram are. When we open up that recommendation service, we're able to trace it back down over to see those processes, see which of the hosts it's actually living on since the cluster has three, um, which is really neat. And of course, we can go over to recommendation service and see what those requests look like. Uh, but because we are right now just validating monitoring, we do see that all of our transactions and services are coming up for the current application, which is perfect. And I just want to see how that CPU spike is doing within the host level of Dynatrace, just to make sure that we are seeing that 75% kick off. And that is exactly what we're seeing. We see that that annotation is still there. And now we are now seeing that our, our Dynatrace is showing that we're seeing 83% usage, which ties up to the 75% increase that we implemented within Gremlin. We'll also get another annotation when the experiment ends. So that's also kind of nice for you to always know, like, is it chaos that's that we implemented or is it just a traffic spike or a memory leak or, or application like not handling something properly? Hey, Anna, just one question came in. Uh, I mean, multiple questions came in, but the uh, one the one that I want to throw over, how do you inject the chaos actually? Do you have an agent that you need to install on those machines? Do you have for Kubernetes maybe an operator that is doing this? How do you, how does Gremlin actually cause 
let's say a CPU hawk? Yes. So Gremlin has an agent. We have installed this agent on our Kubernetes cluster and we installed this via Helm. So by doing the Helm chart, we were able to deploy it. We also have the daemon sets. We install on anything Linux based and we also have a Windows offering. So you just install the agent. The agent then talks to our control plane and is able to pull those attacks. So that's kind of where the experiments get uh, unleashed. So Gremlin is never going to run as root, although all the experiments have have their own different like Linux, Windows, uh, things that are needed in order for them to run. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we're actually talking about like in the Kubernetes space, Gremlin spins up a sidecar container and that's how it actually targets and implements, injects that failure, whatever the experiment is. Cool. So that means you have agents that you install, you can roll them out through Helm charts and Kubernetes. You have all the different platforms supported because one of the questions was, does this also work for, let's say, on-premise physical machines? Yes, it does, because you can install an agent on any type of box that runs anywhere to then uh, inflict chaos. Yep. As long as you have a way to connect to the outside internet, uh, that's definitely how it works. So mm -hmm. folks that are running on-prem and are able to talk to the internet, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in like some of that information, gremlin.com slash docs has it. And the best thing is that we also have the, a way to do the compatibility. Okay. There you go. <laughs> I know how to spell, I promise. So on here, if folks are interested, um, I'll just drop it onto the chat, actually. Mm -hmm. I think only maybe Andy will see it. I'm oh, sure. uh, oh, yeah, let me just forward it to the rest of the team, okay? So on here, we actually get to see that matrix of which distribution of Linux are we working on. You also get to see um, more on that Windows application stuff. Um, so if you're curious about like what else we can run on, just feel free to reach out and we can look into that. And it actually gives you that overview of what those experiments are. Mm -hmm. So let me, okay. So we see that this was a CPU experiment that we just ran. Um, we were able to see that the experiment was successful. We were able to see like those timestamps as well. And the cool thing too, is that you get to come on here and say, monitoring so you can just go ahead and leave a note an observation and i one of the things that i wanted to show earlier that we thankfully didn't have to do is that you can always halt an experiment so there's always a halt button that you can actually execute so i'm going to head back over to my slides and i have this last slide well not last slide but the slide that actually talks about how the results of our experiments were. We validated monitoring. Our application handled CPU load with no issues. We saw that the user was able to add things to the card and check out without any problems. So no problems were detected. Therefore, our conclusion was that we detected that the monitoring was working properly and that was perfect. For the next experiment that I wanted to talk about, I wanted to touch base on those critical versus non-critical service dependencies. And with this, we kind of ask like, what happens if a non-critical dependency fails? We expect our application to handle that failure properly and our user to see no errors. So when we talk about what those like non-critical dependencies are, we think about email service, ad service, currency service, cart service. So by looking at the architecture diagram, we think that if those fail, folks are still able to add things to the cart. We don't necessarily know unless you actually go ahead and implement that experiment. And we'll also touch base how Dynatrace actually makes sure that you can actually validate this prior to running it. But I'll show that after we execute it. So that experiment card is going to show that we're running a black hole experiment. We're going to target just the container of ad service and we're going to run it for 120 seconds. The board conditions are going to be exactly the same where 400, 500 errors are gonna cost for us to halt the experiment along if Dynatrace detects a problem or a browser test fails. So our hypothesis is there's no impact and our application will handle it. So we're gonna get that set up. We'll head on over to set up a new uh, attack, head on over to containers, target my ad service. My blast radius is only one container that lives on this one node and that's only one container that's impacted. We'll select our gremlin, which is gonna be black hole, and it's on the network level. 
as I said, we'll run this for two minutes just to make sure we can browse around Dynatrace and we'll unleash that gremlin. And in that case, what do you technically do? That means you are actually changing IP tables. So what do you what do you do? On no IP tables are changed. The way that this works is that it just blocks traffic from that container to the rest okay. of them mm -hmm. uh, by like spinning up that cycle container. It gets done mm -hmm. when you're actually implementing this in a non-container space or even within containers. You can actually be very specific about the ports that you. Um, are targeting an ingress and egress, and then you can actually like whitelist some of them. So of course we whitelist like the gremlin stuff in order for the experiments to run, but if you have some other processes or you're monitoring that you need to make sure that works, you can uh, implement that. Mm -hmm. So we head on over to our hipster shop to look for that ad service. We see the ad service stops showing up, no ads are being served. So that actually means that our hypothesis is correct. This was not a non-critical application. If it failed, it didn't make, like the user doesn't even know that there's a failure going on, which is the perfect use case that we wanna have. When we head back over to Dynatrace, one of the ways that you can verify the, that architecture diagram prior to running your experiment is that if we look up what that service of ad service is, oh, whoops, I didn't mean to hit on there yet. I got too excited. <laughs> no. So ad service, I wanted to first show that this is that ad service process, but on here we see our ad service um, service itself. So when we open it, we then get to see that service flow because there is no dependencies. For, I mean, sorry, there is uh, like, there's nothing else that you can see from ad service that calls anything. So. You can do the backtrace, right? The back That's the cool thing, yeah. So on backtrace, we get to see the hipster, sh the ad service comes in from the front end, but we're also able to see that it, it is able to handle that failure properly. So you're able to see what those dependencies are on here prior to unleashing that experiment. And Andy mentioned something interesting where the actual requests that are, that are showing up on the front end are a lot less than what the actual ads that are being like sent as requests. So we're still losing some of those requests within there, which is something to dig deeper onto. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to another way that we had this set up within Dynatrace is that we can actually dive down and see that response time. And because ads weren't being served, you see that that response time is going to spike up. I only deployed my Dynatrace like 12 hours ago to this environment. As I mentioned, I played around with various uh, providers. Mm -hmm. So as Dynatrace is actually running more on it, is able to learn more about your system. And this actually would have kicked off a problem if I had this running for like two days. So which is perfect. It allows for us to know that our ads stop being served, but this response time is so high that we will get that problem within Dynatrace. And the cool thing too is that in the, in the how do you do this in a more automated way, you can have Gremlin stop any experiments if Dynatrace detects problems by following some status checks, but mm -hmm. that's for another one. <laughs> so for this one, we see our application handle at service going down. We wanna dig deep. We wanna dig deeper more into how it's being monitored just to make sure that after it's been run there for like those three days, Dynatrace is detecting those problems. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to highlight a couple of tips. I, I was hoping that this was an animated animation on this slide here, but that's okay. Um, so from a Dynatrace side, I know there's a lot of Dynatrace users already on the call. Some are new. Uh, so I think a great way for using chaos engineering is really to validate your monitoring. And I think from a Dynatrace perspective, you showed a lot of experiments now from uh, against Kubernetes. So Dynatrace has uh, Kubernetes monitoring. So all the workloads, all the pods, all the events. So when you run your experiment, you want to make sure that you really have Dynatrace set up to pull in all these things. And, and Dynatrace has the different dashboards, the alerting and everything uh, on that. Um, let me go to, maybe I just hit too much on your end. Let's see, controlling your controlling your uh, your screen, I think just did something that I didn't want. Do you want yeah, to I advance maybe for me before I, I, I destroy something that I shouldn't destroy? So I removed your control. You don't have this anymore. All right, good. <laughs> so 
Um, there you go, know. next slide, yeah. Also, uh, Anna, you mentioned it, uh, that you know, while it's great that from, from a chaos perspective, we can inflict chaos, or let's say on the infrastructure by adding CPU, but what Dynatrace as a monitoring platform gives you is also the visibility in your application health. So request response patterns, HTTP error codes, but also end user monitoring, right? Because we also do end user monitoring. And if you actually do these experiments on a system where you have real users, you wanna know how they impacted yes or no. Uh, next slide, please. The, uh, and then obviously your SLOs. So you mentioned earlier, Dynatrace does automatic baselining. So you just set up your demo environment. Uh, it takes a while until it calculates the baseline and then the, the behavior over a 24 hour period. But you can define your SLOs and you say, hey Dynatrace, how are my SLOs doing while I run my experiment? Because I wanna make sure that if I have chaos, it doesn't impact my SLOs, you know, because otherwise you would get penalized if this also happened in, in production. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you obviously validate your Dynatrace Smartscape. You showed it greatly also in our discussion that Smartscape, the automatic topology view that we have, horizontal and vertical dependency shows you exactly which services really talk to each other, whether you have a hard dependency, whether you have a soft dependency or critical, non-critical dependency. And in case there is a problem that comes in, let's say you are talking about one case with uh, inflicting latency. If a, if a latency issue, let's say from one service to another is causing exceptions because of a bad timeout setting, Dynatrace will actually show you this through end-to-end -end tracing through our PureBev technology where your code is not gracefully handling certain situations. Uh, next slide, I think I have one or two more. Uh, yeah, synthetic, you mentioned that I think it's very important that when you run experiments, you really always validate not only through HTTP status checks if your services are still returning HTTP 200, but really use synthetic checks to really click through your most important, most business critical use case scenarios. And Dynatrace has this built in and you can test this from all sorts of different global locations, but also your local locations, meaning uh, in-house. That's also very important. Great thing for SLA monitoring. And uh, one more thing as a reminder, uh, two more things actually. Yeah, you showed this, the, um, the Gremlin events. This was also a question that came up. Does Gremlin talk to Dynatrace? Yes, and you, you showed it to us. Every time you start an experiment, Gremlin sends this information to Dynatrace so that if Dynatrace starts raising alerts, we actually correlate that Gremlin attack event to that alert. So whoever then receives the alert, as part of your, uh, of your practice run knows, okay, this is not really an alert that we're expecting because it came from that attack. And uh, as a good practice is, you know, having the start event. And I think if you click next, you also see the end event. There's also an option and we should talk about it in Dynatrace to send a single event for the whole time period. Then you see them in one thing as well, but this is something maybe for next steps. And um, the next slide I think shows also a question that was just asked, can then Dynatrace send notifications to different tools? Yes, it can. So when Dynatrace detects a problem, like on the left side here, you see an example where Easy Travel, one of my sample apps that I always use, has a problem. It tells you what's the impact of the app, how many users are impacted, but also what's the root cause. And in case you're sending over the Gremlin event, it actually tells you as part of the root cause, it was not only CPU saturation, but yes, it was caused by the Gremlin CPU attack, which means this is information you can then send to your Slack channel, uh, to your service now, to, to Captain Open Source Project. You can trigger your remediation scripts, but maybe you also want to filter it if it's a real, uh, let's say, planned attack, then you just want to test if, you know, let's say your regular notification mechanisms work and you may not want to send something out on Twitter that your Gremlin attack actually worked. Oh, right. That actually would be a fun Twitter bot. <laughs> that would be a fun Twitter bot. Exactly. Uh, so Andy got a chance to mention a, a little bit about how does Gremlin send information to Dynatrace. So if you're interested in actually how to set up Dynatrace with Gremlin or actually how to set up the webhook annotations, you can head on over to gremlin.com slash community. And there you can just search the word Dynatrace. These two tutorials will show up. That first one just talks about how to install Gremlin, how to install Dynatrace. And that second one actually guides you in setting up that webhooks for Dynatrace to talk to Gremlin. And we wanted to just add a slide of like, what does chaos engineering maturity actually look like? The end goal is for us to run these experiments across all of the environments, but specifically run them on production. 
and getting to a maturity to have this automated, whether it's within your CICD, whether you have scheduled stuff, whether it's implementing them through an SDK, that's also really, really important. How do we actually get there? One of the first things that you wanna think about with chaos engineering is that you wanna start really small. You wanna build your confidence and slowly uh, mature that way. So you wanna introduce chaos engineering to only one team at a time, one service at a time, whatever works best for your organization. You wanna start off in pre-prod environments in order to build that confidence. So you wanna then go ahead and schedule those attacks. You can use the API, you can do scheduling attacks to run within like nine to five of your weekdays. Or uh, you can implement that within your CICD pipelines. And then that extra maturity comes from having now like your team run game days to, to run more experiments, do fire drills to train all your team to be ready to handle this incidents. And that of course, that last step is making sure you're not drifting into failure. You want to reproduce prior conditions that have led to an outage to make sure that you are resilient to them. And if those conditions were to happen, you won't be drifting into failure. With those success metrics for chaos engineering, how do you actually track where a lot of this, like how, like your progress to this? I think uh, Andy got a chance to talk a little bit about those SLOs and SLAs. It's really, really important in order for, for folks to be able to track it if they actually have that baseline level and then are able to see how the SLOs and SLAs actually have gotten better or if you're using those error budgets to implement experiments, that's perfect too. You wanna keep in mind those error rates, response times, availability. Those are the metrics that allow for you to prove how chaos engineering could be helping your organization. And of course, MTTD and MTTR, you're gonna see that the more, more often that your team runs chaos engineer experiments, the mean time to detection will go down as well as the mean time to remediate these incidents. For some best practices to do chaos engineering with Dynatrace, you always want to be observer, observing. So making sure that you're always looking at Dynatrace, that you have set up those browser tests to replicate the user clicks, maybe even being a an user and clicking through your application. And of course, making sure that Dynatrace has been set up properly. So you want to make sure you have infrastructure, application monitoring, those synthetics tests on the HTTP on the browser side that end user monitoring, and of course, making sure that your problems are actually triggering alerts. That way folks are actually able to acknowledge them and do something about it. With that, I know we're running really short on time, but we wanted to make sure to extend an invite out to y'all to join the larger chaos engineering community. Uh, you can join the Slack channel easily by, that, by going to gremlin.com slash community, and there's a Slack link on there. There's over 5,800 members that are, are on there from people that are just getting started in this practice. And you can actually reach out to Andy and I on there because we're both actually use that chat always to talk. So you can actually just DM both of us with your questions for today's webinar. We also wanna invite you to a larger chaos engineering conference. This is the third year that chaos conf is happening. It's gonna be virtual from October 6, 7 and 8. This is gonna be amazing talks, amazing workshops happening across time zones in the US and Europe. So head on over to chaosconf.io to sign up. We have some, some cool stuff coming for it. And if you're interested in actually learning more about some of the stuff that I talked about, I lead our educational program at Gremlin. So we do free chaos engineering boot camps of like the fundamentals of chaos engineering. Automating chaos engineering is the other one that I just like built. So sign up on gremlin.com slash bootcamps and more of them will actually be showing up shortly. So with that, I'll kick it on to Andy for the next slides. Yeah, just a couple more slides and then questions because there's so many questions that are still that are still out there. Um, and I guess I need your help again to kind of flip through the slides. There's a couple of things that Anna and I, as we discussed, want to do as next steps, especially around our open source project, Captain, and integrating chaos engineering with automating quality checks in your pipeline uh, as you're running experiments and also automating the validation of your auto remediation scripts. So if you do me a favor, if you click on next, just to highlight quickly how this looks like, um, 
they, one of the uh, things that Captain, in case you have never heard about it, www.captain.sh uh, or go on, on GitHub, we're a CNCF project. Uh, Captain provides automated continuous delivery, event driven. So where it delivers, it then runs tests and then does a quality gate check against SLOs. Now, Anna, if you do me the favor and just uh, there's a little animation. So if you have Captain set up and what we are planning to do is as a developer says, I have a new artifact, Captain first deploys. Then the next step that comes is it starts running a load test, let's say JMeter or NeoLoad or any other, so putting some load on the system. And then while the test is running, if you do me another favor and click again, injecting chaos, right? Because the idea is you get a new build, you want to put it on the load, and then you want to enforce chaos because the goal should be that each individual container and service should be resilient enough on its own. And what Captain does is the next step, if you click again, is it actually evaluates your SLOs fully automatically after this period where you have a new build deployed into an environment, run on the load, and also experiments are run on it because in the end, uh, your SLO should not be impacted. And this can be fully integrated into your delivery pipeline. So that's the first thing. And the second thing we wanna do, and there's two examples, but we may just do just one uh, in, in sake of time to have more time for, uh, for questions. So in case you're running uh, your, engine, your, your chaos uh, experiments, let's say in a production environment, like as you said earlier, then Dynatrace will detect the problem, will send it to Captain, right? It can obviously send it to Slack as well, but Captain is the open source project that also orchestrates the remediation of problems. So what you can give Captain is a runbook, or we call it a remediation definition as code. And in case there is a CPU problem that is causing, let's say, a conversion rate drop on your experiment, this is something obviously that you don't want, you can do as a first step, let's say, scale up, right? There's a, there's a CPU issue, so let's scale up. After scaling up, Captain immediately validates, did this action actually solve the problem, yes or no? Because this is also what you want to do in production. You want to force some change, some, some, some chaos, validate that your automated remediations actually work. And Anna, as you said, if this doesn't work, then it would execute the next thing like halting the attack. It's kind of like your abort uh, condition, right? Because you obviously don't want to have a real negative impact on your end users. Um, yeah, and Captain is then reevaluating, and essentially, if this even doesn't solve the problem, that means your chaos com cause complete chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, then obviously, it can still escalate. But that's kind of the uh, idea uh, with with Captain. Yeah. Um, and yeah, this is just you can click over it the next one, or you wanna unless you wanna say something else. No, I was just going to say that these are the perfect examples of, of, of things that we know are going to happen. So it's better if you make them happen in your own terms. That way, you know, you're ready. It's not two in the morning. Your engineers are not groggy or you're not groggy. Um, and you can actually think about your, your systems properly. Exactly. And the thing is, right, if you start thinking about auto remediation, uh, I think the best case scenario is you actually test your automated, your, 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 and when you start automating your runbooks, you you first probably want to do it in a safe environment, like your pre-prod environment. I think the combination of Gremlin enforcing chaos, Dynatrace detecting the problem, then Captain automating the execution to bring the system back into a healthy state is a great way to test and validate your automa automated runbooks before you first try it in production. So that's kind of a good point. All right, so with this, um, there's two things I want to, relaunch the polling because some people have said they didn't get a chance to uh, to do the polling so i opened up the poll the polls again for the initial question we had like um uh how was how does you know how do you know okay uh, uh, what does chaos engineering mean for you um i think i saved the initial result uh so that means we later on we need to do an aggregate across these two <laughs> Uh, while this is running, uh, Anna, thank you first of all so much for uh, for answering or for showing us what chaos engineering is all about. Your insights, it's great with your history of being, of working at Uber first and now at Gremlin for more than two years and doing all of these great talks and uh, integrations and partnering up with us. That's great. Um, I think you probably see the questions uh, yourself, but I want to highlight a, a couple that I think have not yet been answered. Um, yeah. The, uh, can you schedule experiments without user intervention? Like, can you do this? And do you have a scheduler where you can say every day at seven o'clock you want to run an experiment? Yes. So uh, with that on here, for example, that black hole experiment that I just ran, 
when I just went ahead and pressed rerun. So all the config of what I implemented was on there. But on here, you see that it was run the attack and I never clicked on it because I was unleashing it now. But I can go ahead and schedule it for later. So you can make it happen randomly every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I want this to run three times every single day. And I want this to run from 9 a.m. to maybe just 12 because I want to be thinking about other time zones. Mm -hmm. So now that I did that, this just got scheduled. So now my block hole is going to run three times a day. It's going to block hole ad service. And it's, it's great. The cool thing too is that you could have actually scheduled it also from the API. So you can actually schedule them as you throw them into your CI CD pipeline. Perfect. Um, the next question that came in into the chat, by the way, I just posted a lot of links on the chat because somebody asking, can you go back to the links? Um, I just posted all of these oh. in the chat. Another question that came in was, uh, are there any, uh, do you have service partners that actually provide, let's say, chaos engineering as a, as a, as a service where they are doing attacks in case an organization doesn't have the resources to do it internally? No, so that I know if we don't, I can check back with our sales team because I know we were partnering up with some resellers and like for Europe, we had our own like a Europe team as well that mm -hmm. were like helping folks. Um, but to be fair, like with, with Gremlin, like it's a pretty easy to use SaaS platform. So if you're an engineer that's like, oh, I don't think I can do this by myself, just go ahead and give it a try. Talk to our team because when you sign up for Gremlin as an enterprise pro customer, you actually get consultants with it. So you will get your solutions architect that's going to work with you post sales to run your first experiments, to think about what are some of the failures you've had. And these are some things that happen with the proof of concept as, as you're doing the pre-sale stuff. And then of course, after you've signed those deals, you can have guided game days where Gremlin is going to be with you being like, this is how you implement the experiment. This is how you look at the architecture diagram. This is how you install it. So our team works as consultants to help folks. But of course, after we do that, like some of it is like more of a professional service after that. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, one question that came in is, uh, what, what do you suggest as the frequency of chaos engineering that should be performed within a given year, right? I guess the more the, more the better, I think we just said, it should be part of your continuous delivery even. Yep, but it, how should do people... be, it should be automated. Um, it should be running on production. Like that, that is where you want to end up. So of course, if you had this automated within your CI, CD, um, you're going to have this happen every single time you do a new build, which is perfect. You know that every new time that you're putting new code into your application, you're not regressing into failure. So mm -hmm. if you're having a hundred builds, a hundred deploys a day, that's as often as you want to be running experiments. Then the other question, um, uh, what type of local storage does Gremlin use on the agents to send the data back to Gremlin? Is this, are you using your proprietary thing? Are you using Prometheus? How do you uh, send data back? Uh, some, some architectural questions around Gremlin. So there is a client overhead that talks about what is it that we need. Mm -hmm. um, so on those specifics, I actually don't fully know what it is. Like I know we're not using Prometheus. Um, we're mostly just having like the information about the attacks Like we don't collect anything about your host or anything. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. have a chance to like, look at the tag so that our UI like renders that into targeting. Mm -hmm. Um, but we only know when the experiments are executed and the client overhead actually I think gives a little bit more of that explanation. Um, like it really uses like very, very little resources, like in, in terms of storage on this we're just talking about like 35 megabytes yeah cool all right but that is you know i think this is a great page to get started um then the other question uh, that's answered live the performance impact you just mentioned this as well or from a dynatrace perspective right we are the monitoring platform that means our agents that are also running on your physical hardware or your virtual or your clusters, uh, we, we are monitoring every single transaction and all these infrastructure process pod level metrics. Um, and from an overhead perspective, and I'm just quoting some of our customers and I'm sure this goes for most or many monitoring tools out there. It's about one to 2% of overhead that we have, even though we monitor and trace every single end-to-end -end transaction, including all the infrastructure metrics. For more information, I would say 
uh, go to the case studies we have out there where we have our customers speak about the overhead. Um, then there's a question about the events that Gremlin sent in to Dynatrace. Is this just possible for Gremlin? No, this is obviously Dynatrace has an event API. That means you can send in any type of events, whether this is a Gremlin notifying Dynatrace about an experiment, whether this is uh, a load testing tool to tell Dynatrace about when a load test starts, whether it's a continuous delivery tool like Jenkins or Harness or anybody else that is sending Dynatrace information about when a deployment happened. Dynatrace provides an event API where you can push these events in. So have a look at this event API. Um, there is a ton of questions. I think we, we answered them, like kind of, again, coming back to what's the difference between chaos engineering and all of these other, uh, uh, you know, methodologies or approaches of, you know, vulnerability testing, uh, performance and peak load testing. Uh, I think we answered it, but still maybe, because I'm sure you get this question a lot. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely hear the question of like, I'm already doing testing. Like, how does this differentiate? Whether it's like all these different types of testing and it's like, because the, the idea with chaos engineering is that you're experimenting in prod, like nothing is going to change, like going to get close to being able to do this in production and being able to inject those failures. The way that they get injected is not stuff that gets done in this like usual type of testing ways. And I think one of the other things that comes out of it sometimes that we hear folks say is like, it's all testing prior to getting to production and production you're doing more of like experiment based so mm -hmm. with chaos engineering we try to say no you're doing chaos engineering or ex experiments along the way but of course when you're doing them in production those are the ones that are the most critical that mm -hmm. you need to be more careful with but that doesn't mean that you can't get so much wins of doing them in staging and development mm -hmm. like one of the things like a gremlin of course we do gremlin on gremlin um mm -hmm. we we have various projects that do that so with one of the things that we did is that we ran a game day within our services and we ran it within staging and we ended up realizing that our monitoring for staging was missing a lot um and it, it like didn't it didn't reflect the the failure that we were injecting so we went ahead after and like that retrospective we had action items like go implement all these changes into our staging dashboards the best thing is that after we implemented that into our staging dashboard that also is our production dashboard so we just had wins by being able to run experiments and staging in that pre-prod environment that later turn into wins when certain conditions can happen in prod yeah uh, I want to put one more over. Uh, what SLA and pass criteria do you keep for these types of tests, like uh, accepted number of errors or data loss? Um, I think you had your abort criteria, you know, in your in your in your uh, cards. But I uh, just wanted to see. Yeah, get so with with that, like uh, for SLAs, like I think that just varies very much depending on the organization, the way that you have it set up with your customers. Um, we see that folks have SLAs as like 95%. We see folks that keep it at like 99% or like 99.9%. So, but like, it depends just how much you actually have um, that you can actually experiment with. Um, but I think trying to keep for, for chaos engineering, not to cause any harm is kind of like where that big stuff is. So for organizations that have implemented SLAs, one of the things that we have learned is that some of them actually use that error budget that they implemented with their SLA practices and use that budget to implement experiments. And that's how like they're making sure that they're putting that money to, to use in a way. And when it comes to um, those, was the board Yeah. The, the success criteria was your other question. Um, the success criteria that, dif that, dif that is very different depending on your application. So you saw that, that, that second experiment that I launched, it was very much of my application crashes, that's an abort condition. The cool thing with Gremlin and with Dynatrace, with, plan with using both of them together, is that you can then use Gremlin to implement something called status checks. And status checks is a way for you to build that success criteria with, within it. So what you do is, for example, you have Gremlin say, if Dynatrace finds a problem, I want you to stop running experiments. So I can just easily show you what that will look like. On new scenario, we'll go ahead and do a status check. 
So the status check is going to be a continuous check. It's going to pull every 10 seconds. Um, we go on here to do our custom endpoint URL. So on here, we'll do the Dynatrace, like the browser test API. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after that happens to be successful, then the experiments can continue. Um, like this might not make sense because I didn't fully implement it or yeah, like yeah, I didn't yeah. show an example, but That's it good. basically says if a status check fails, stop the experiment. Stop, and that experiment, is your success yeah. evaluation yeah. in an automated fashion. Mm -hmm. I think I have some on here that, oh no, maybe I don't. Mm -hmm. um, I've run a few ones in a different team, so status check uh, this one is validating auto scaling so that status check is actually hitting like status page github and then it runs an experiment so if this success criteria was to fail gremlin actually stops the experiment if there's a critical um dependency outage on the status check it would fail it same thing with status page you can also do this with any other alerting pager duty mm -hmm. um any any other type of tooling you just pull the api and then the experiments execute and maybe you want to have a status check at the end because with status checks you get to do them continuously or you can do it before an experiment starts after an experiment starts so it's like you're able to always validate it within an automated fashion mm -hmm. Cool. Hey, um, I think, you know, we're about 60 minutes over time and I know there's still people out there that have questions, but I, be, I think the best is actually to go to uh, the chaos engineering Slack. I, I believe that's the yes. best way, as you said, right. Then they find you, they find me. And uh, yeah, Anna, thank you so much. Muchas gracias por tu presentación. It was amazing. And uh, there's definitely so much more content and so many more ideas that we came up with uh, that I'm pretty sure we'll see more of each other over the next yeah. weeks and months. Yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. Thank you very much for having like muchas gracias. And thank you everyone for watching us today, whether you're watching the live stream or you're going to watch the recording. We really appreciate it. But like Andy mentioned, like th this is just the beginning. Like thank we're you, only yeah. teaching you the fundamentals. You can go and continue learning on your own. You can reach out to us so that we can empower you in your education journey. You can also come to our, the trainings that I run. So feel free to, to go ahead and do that. Very cool. And as you just said, the recording will be up shortly, uh, either for on demand, if you have registered and you can get the link anyway, you can watch it again on demand. It will also be uploaded to the Dynatrace YouTube channel and Dynatrace community members can also go to university.dynatrace.com where we'll also be uploading the slides. All right. Very cool. Then I'm going to uh, end this now. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe and healthy out there. Uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.